So it's good to be here. And I don't remember, I was hugging Angela, but I graduated from Trinity as an MDiv student back a while ago, just a few years. And it's always good to come back and be with this community. And I feel really blessed to be among the Mosaic community in particular because I was in this small incubation formation group with Dr. Peter Cha that was kind of just the beginning of a dream and a vision for Mosaic. So now to see this community, I love it. It blesses me so much. So I'm glad to be back here. And a small shameless plug, if anyone is looking for a dynamic, meaningful internship with me at North Park University, just contact me. Agip at northpark.edu. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is my disclaimer for my dear husband, Joshua, and I guess viewers and you all. I did add a few of my own thoughts in here. Okay, but 90% of this is Dr. Joshua Jip. Okay, so when he says I, it is mostly Joshua Jip. And I'm happy to be here, so here we go. Some of you may remember a few months ago that the Attorney General of the United States, Jeff Sessions, quoted the 13th chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. In what context do you try to recall? Attorney General Sessions re referenced Romans 13 to justify his administration's intentional policy of separating children from their parents who were seeking undocumented entry into this country. The hope here for Jeff Sessions and the Trump administration was that the policy of separating families would deter illegal crossing at the border. When people quickly criticized this policy as brutal and inhumane, Attorney General Sessions responded with these words, and I quote, illegal entry into the United States is a crime, as it should be. Persons who violate the law of our nation are subject to prosecution. I would cite to you the Apostle Paul and his clear and wise command in Romans 13 to obey the laws of the government because God has ordained them for the purpose of order." End quote. As we know, Jeff Sessions is not the first in governmental authority to cite the Apostles Paul clear and wise command from Romans 13. Of course, the Bible also exhorts God's people to love their neighbors and their enemies. <clears throat> Ironically, immediately prior to the often quoted portion of Romans 13, Paul exhorts God's people to love neighbor and enemy. In a time long before the Roman Empire, God also repeatedly exhorts Israel to show love and hospitality to the immigrant who resides in their land. You shall not wrong or oppress an immigrant, for you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. Exodus 22. When an immigrant resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the immigrant. The immigrant who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the immigrant as yourself, for you were immigrants in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 19. In the New Testament, we may remember another attorney's attempt to draw boundaries around who we must show love to and Jesus' subsequent response found in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story that demands a remarkably wide definition of neighbor. But if Jeff Sessions is right, that the Bible teaches obedience to the laws of the governing authorities, and the Bible teaches that God's people are to pursue justice and hospitality for all people, then are we simply left in a situation where one chooses the biblical text they happen to like best, and ignore the texts that do not immediately benefit them. Are we in a stalemate? As the people of God, what are we to make of this? How ought we to respond? What is the relationship among God, the government, and, well, us, the body of Christ? A 15-minute talk is clearly not enough time to develop a full-fledged response to these questions. And to be honest, I think your response to these matters is best worked out in a community like Mosaic that has a habit of practicing theological and biblical discernment among brothers and sisters who represent diverse backgrounds and experiences and perspectives, including and in fact amplifying 
the voices from the margins, rather than simply finding the answers from a talking head. But I do think I, Dr. Jip and his wife, could give us a few helpful theses that all Christians should consider as we engage the question of how followers of Jesus respond to government. I have five theses and three practical suggestions to offer you this morning. Thesis number one, the Bible teaches that Christians should seek to respect and, if possible, obey the authorities that are placed over them. Romans 13, 1 through 7. See also 1 Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jeremiah. God has gifted to governing authorities some ability to order human society. We might say that these authorities are tasked with pursuing some basic common good and order for society. Now, the way that gets played out is a perennial debate within political philosophy, but at minimum, I think most of us probably take this for granted in our daily lives. I'm speaking like an idealist here, but aren't most of us thankful that there are traffic laws in place, for instance? Most of us may also agree that, to some sense, taxes make sense insofar as they, theoretically, provide us things like good roads, a mail system, and public education for our children. And even with respect to our primary topic, despite their many dysfunctions, abuses, and perpetuations of injustice, I think many of us probably think that states and governments have some kind of right to regulate their borders and vet those who enter their country. As a result, and again, insofar as it is possible, followers of Christ should do all they can to submit to, cooperate with, give appropriate respect, and support those in positions of governmental authority. Why? Because we understand that the scriptures teach that the governing authorities, when they function well, are tasked with pursuing some limited common good for society. Also, because we hope and pray that our lifestyle will be an evangelistic testimony to those who are in positions of power and because we hope that the authorities will allow Christians to live peaceful and quiet lives, as 1 Timothy 2.2 instructs. Thesis number two. The Bible teaches that followers of Jesus are citizens of the kingdom of God and owe exclusive and complete allegiance to Christ. Most of us in this room are citizens of some nation-state, but as followers of Jesus, our primary identity and citizenship is that all of us are citizens of God's kingdom. And this kingdom citizenship takes priority over every other claim for our loyalty. This one might be the most important thesis, and yet I hope I don't have to work too hard to convince you of this reality. Let me here just remind you how frequently God's people are spoken of as immigrants and aliens with respect to their earthly sojourn. Philippians 3 says, our citizenship is in heaven. Hebrews 11 speaks of the Old Testament heroes of faith as aliens and strangers on earth who are journeying to their heavenly country. Three times, 1 Peter refers to the churches as aliens, strangers, and sojourners. A few matters follow from this understanding of our identity as strangers and aliens in this world. Because Christians are sojourners and strangers in this world and are citizens of God's kingdom, then thesis number two is true. Again, the Bible teaches that followers of Jesus are citizens of the kingdom of God and owe exclusive and complete allegiance to Christ. Thesis number three. The Bible testifies that our allegiance to Christ will, on occasion, bring us into conflict with our governing authorities. Let me share with you a few more biblical texts that Attorney General Jeff Sessions did not cite. There are really too many to list, but I think of the Hebrew midwives who disobeyed Pharaoh's command to kill the Hebrew baby boys, as recorded in Exodus 1. I think of the court tales of Daniel and his three friends who face a den of lions and a fiery furnace because of their primary allegiance to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
The New Testament apostles also refused to stop proclaiming the gospel, courageously declaring, we must obey God and not humans. Acts chapter 5. I also think of the book of James and his harsh criticism of the legislative policies of the landowners whose power and control of the markets enabled them to exploit and withhold just payment from their workers. James chapter 5. I think of the book of Revelation where the economy, military, and religion of the Roman Empire are idolatrous and destructive for human flourishing and the common good. John refers to Rome's economic system as the whore of Babylon, chapter 18, and he castigates it for its consumptive greed, for benefiting the elites at the expense of the minority, for the exploitation involved in human slavery as it trades and imports human bodies, and for killing the righteous who criticize Rome's economic, political, and military. The call we find in the book of Revelation is this, Come out from her. Resist. Do not compromise one's allegiance to Jesus, the true king. In other words, there is something of attention or dialectic in the biblical text. On the one hand, do all you can to respect governing authorities. Yet on the other hand, your primary allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom, and this will inevitably result in conflict between the kingdom of the world and the kingdom you belong to, that of Jesus Christ. The tension is displayed well in the book of Acts. The main characters in Acts are empathic. I don't think that's emphatic that they are, I was like, I don't think they're empathic. The main characters in Acts are emphatic that they are not interested in challenging Caesar's throne. They frequently deny that they are politically rebellious, and, every, and yet in every city where they go, the city is thrown into turmoil when these early Christians bring their message of the resurrected King Jesus and his way of life. This is stated well in Acts chapter 17 when Paul and Silas travel to Thessalonica and a riot begins in the city. The accusation that is brought against them is this. <clears throat> these people are turning the world upside down and they're doing these things that are contrary to Caesar's decrees and they're proclaiming someone else is king. Jesus. Acts 17. Again, this sort of thing happens in almost every city where the apostles travel. What is the point? The point is, if Jesus is king, then authentic Christian worship consists of complete allegiance to him and the way of life that he taught. And these are never the ordinary values and allegiances of human governments. In fact, they are often directly opposed or at odds with the values of worldly governments. Thesis number four, given that our singular allegiance is to Christ and his kingdom, Christians should not obey unjust and wicked laws. When governments overstep their bounds and advance policies that are unjust and wicked, Christian communities need to discern what faithfulness to Christ the king will look like in this conflict. And in some instances, this will involve civil disobedience and bearing the brunt of its consequences. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, in his letter from Birmingham jail, declared this in his address to eight prominent clergymen from Alabama. There are two types of laws. There are just and there are unjust laws. We can never forget that everything Hitler did in Germany was legal and it was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. There are all kinds of state or government-led evil and wickedness that is, by the rules of the state, entirely legal. As Dr. King guides us, our minds quickly go to the atrocities perpetuated against Jews and other marginalized communities of Europe by Hitler and the Third Reich. You might also think about the apartheid in South Africa, 
or the evils of slavery, Jim Crow segregation, and the injustices of mass incarceration and police brutality today against black and brown bodies in our country. Today we respect and honor those like Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Dr. Martin Luther King, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, K Corey Ten Boom, Nelson Mandela, and many, many others, all who acted illegally when they broke their nation's laws for the good of their neighbor and their society because they knew their nation's laws were unjust and wicked. Thesis number five. Christians should carefully consider their own social location when they are discerning complex ethical decisions and actions. By social location, I'm simply referring to the specifics of your personal identity, background, experiences, and how it plays a role in how you read the biblical texts. Unfortunately, Romans 13 has proved to be a favorite text for tyrants and for those in positions of power, as it seemingly lends God's authority and approval for them to do whatever they want. Romans 13, again, was used to endorse Hitler's policies in Germany. The Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa appealed to Romans 13 and other biblical texts to support apartheid against black South Africans. And white churches and other churches in this country used Romans 13 to speak against slavery and the civil rights movement. Simply put, any use of Romans 13 that lends itself to blind obedience to the government and or support for policies that harm those who are already vulnerable is a bad interpretation of the text. So when a politician or an attorney cites one biblical text in his talk regarding the policy of separating children from their parents and he doesn't appeal to the rest of the context of Romans, owe nothing to anyone except to love your neighbor, love does no wrong to a neighbor, then he doesn't engage the plethora of texts in the Bible that demand justice, hospitality, and a refusal to exploit the immigrants and the vulnerable, then I believe that his social location may be dictating his appeal to scripture in a very uncritical way. A short talk like this can only make some suggestions for how to think and how to move forward. Obviously, there are so many questions and concerns that I have not addressed, but I hope that these five theses will stimulate healthy conversation. Let me conclude by briefly mentioning three practical steps that I think all of us, I would hope, could agree upon as it pertains to engaging God and government and immigration. First, Christians should evaluate political rhetoric and candidates running for public office and those holding office within the framework of what the scriptures say about the immigrant. This does not mean Christians can't engage in a serious conversation about what it means to regulate our country's borders. It doesn't mean that we can't have honest disagreements about what might be best for this country or any other country as it pertains to good le legislation. But it does mean that the frequent ethnic, cultural, and religious stereotyping that scapegoats immigrants must be emphatically rejected by Jesus followers. The gospel demands that we reject all forms of xenophobic rhetoric and policy. Second, Christians should actively educate themselves about migration, its causes, history, legislation, and so forth so that we can advocate for just legislation regarding immigration policies. As I stated in thesis one, we must not ignore those passages that call for respect and submission to the governing authorities. But in our democratic society, we should honor these te texts by working for legislation that is just and loving. Honestly, if you just read one book I would recommend Matthew Sorens and Jenny Yang's Welcoming the Stranger. May I also recommend you follow Matthew Sorens on Twitter. Welcoming the Stranger introduces readers to the complex history of immigration in the United States. It engages in thoughtful policy analysis, shares powerful stories of the experience of immigrants, and surveys what the Bible might have to say for how we think of compassion and justice for immigrants. 
The third practical step. As a follower of Jesus, engage in meaningful relationships and friendships with immigrants and refugees by volunteering with programs like World Relief, intentionally looking for ways to befriend parents at your kid's school, your coworkers and neighbors, and your classmates right here at TED's. Many of the immigrants who come to the United States are looking for and in need of meaningful friendships, for community, and often for places of worship. Many of them are also, in fact, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and our ability to extend and receive hospitality creates possibilities for the renewal of our churches. We have some questions for table conversations. They're on your tables. I've modified just slightly. Number one, does your social location play a role in causing you to gravitate towards certain biblical texts rather than other biblical texts when you make ethical decisions about immigration? If so, in what ways? Number two, based on personal friendships or relationships with immigrants, migrant workers, or refugees, or perhaps your own personal experience. I am guessing in a room this size, we have immigrants, children of immigrants, perhaps children of refugees. This is very personal to you. What do you know about the experience of immigrants, migrant workers, refugees? How can you learn more? And number three, to what extent should the Old Testament's teaching on hospitality and justice for the immigrant influence how Americans think and act with respect to immigrants? Thank you.